Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you for the invitation to this talk. I would have loved to be present there, but uh, last minute, last minute situation made it impossible for me to travel there. But GBT is still one of the best places to visit. So looking forward to a, another another time. So at this time, I would just would like to give you um, a, a broad update on what are the results that we're being accomplishing as part of the GBT Ammonia survey. This is a survey that uh, we have co-led with the racial prison, and we have a huge, uh, like very important team that have made all of this possible. So, so just to get started, um, why star formation? So in this case, what this survey is, is all about gas, all about the gas in star forming regions. But why should you care if you're not doing uh, star formation per se? If you're doing, for example, extragalactic studies, it's very important to understand how is the star formation uh, process as a function of column density. Um, that is the famous Kinnikut Schmidt law. But at the other hand, uh, at the other extreme of scales, you would like to understand how our planets formed. In this case, the planet formation connection with star formation is it's much more clear in the sense that to form the planets, first we need to form the disks and a star, and those are the those are properties just set during the star formation process, which are which are um, the main topic that we're. I'll be talking about. But on the other hand, if you're looking at the, at the very large galactic scales, even at those scales, you're interested in the local star formation. Because at some point, what, what we know from this relation is that um, it's a relation of column densities, but it is not clear uh, if what's the real microphysics of star formation within the volumes that are being probed with the big beams uh, used to study the external galaxies. So is star formation relation a uh, volumetric relation? Is it related to column density? Or uh, maybe it's determined by the dense gas that is uh, gathered and how turbulence is dissipated. So in order to understand that, all of these microphysics for star formation, we need to go to places where we can really uh, resolve the structures. And, getting into our own galaxy is the first place. So just going back to the ancient studies from the 80s, uh, really pioneer work uh, looking at the properties of, of molecular clouds by a, by a theorist. So uh, Larson basically put together measurements from many, many uh, papers that uh, were observing the, the line width and the size of the emission in CO towards different molecular clouds. And he was able to, to probe, um, to, to prove this relation that is, is called the Larson's law that basically relates that the amount of turbulence <clears throat> in the interstellar medium traced by CO is, is a power law comp related to the scale of what you're probing. And if you look at the scales, uh, this, this red circle at the bottom left is what marks the sonic scale. That means that all the points basically in this plot, they are, they are showing supersonic levels of turbulence. And in this case, this was a, a bit surprising. So in, in a way, it started to, pay, uh, to, to paint a picture for how are we going to form uh, the stars from a turbulent molecular cloud, which is basically the, the current picture that we have now. Uh, however, if we take a look at molecular clouds, recent studies from Herschel, for example, have shown that these clouds, they're not, they not just blobs, they're not spheres, they're not a collection of spheres. These, are con these contain many, many uh, filaments within these, the clouds, and in this case, and in this case, you can see, for example, that there is a, can you hear me? I hear a lot of noise on the. We can hear you, go ahead, Jaime. We'll try to get okay. people to mute. Okay, um, so in this case, basically we, 
we see a lot of filaments that are hosting the dense cores. So the one in fact always the mechanics Dave, I think I think you are you are unmuted. Okay. Um what we do know is that dense cores, the places where stars are formed, are, are very, are very, are compact, are very compact places. And we need to know the properties of those places to study the star formation process. Okay. Uh, so how do we connect the two different scales? We have the scales of the clouds, the filaments, and we have the scales of the cores. Uh, and some of the properties that we know of the cores is that they are subsonic. They show subsonic levels of turbulence and they're extremely cold. So how do we go from a highly supersonic cloud to a subsonic core um, and we make it like a smooth transition? That's something that it's been uh, challenging to study for many years. And that's one of the things that uh, pushed us to pursue some of these, uh, some of these maps. Uh, one of the key tools that we're using uh, for to study dense cores is ammonia. So NH3 uh, is one of the simple molecules that we can use to study the star formation beyond molecules like CO or HCO plus. And basically, this is extremely useful because uh, it's very hard to freeze out from the gas phase. So we are very good at at, at tracing most of the volume within these dense cores. Uh, moreover, what, when we look at the spectrum of ammonia, this is a spectrum of ammonia, and we can see that there are many, many different, uh, many, many different hyperfine components, all in one, in one shot. And those are all coming from one transition line. And in this case, the, the beauty of this is that since we know the uh, relative weights, the relative statistical weights between the hyperfine components, we can use these to have exquisite um, accuracy on the velocity information of the gas that is being probed by ammonia. So in this case, we can get very good measurements of central velocity line width, not only because the lines get narrow towards the course, but also because we start to see many of these replica lines uh, at lower um, at lower uh, signal, but and separated, so they, we have many times the same template to fit. On the other hand, um, on the other hand, thanks to this plot of the uh, energy as a function of um, for the different uh, transitions for the different for the different transitions of uh, of the, of the molecule of ammonia, we can see that there are some metastable levels that follow at the bottom of the of this ladder. So you, if you start at the top, you very, very quickly um, uh, decay radi radi radiatively. That means that at the end, you can take the ratio of the endpoints of these ladders and just use that as a, as a thermometer because that's gonna be determined only by the, uh, by the collisions, only by the kinetic temperature. So using ammonia, and are detecting two lines, the ammonia 1, 1, and the ammonia 2, 2, allow us to have two good measurements of the gas properties and the temperature. Okay, and the temperature is very important because it's also very important to, for all the chemistry. So most of the time, it's very hard to, to get a temperature map if it's not using ammonia. And and in this case, we can get a direct measurement of the temperature with ammonia, and we can get maps of that, which is extremely, extremely nice. Um, some of the things that we have known for some time is that um, if we do pointed observations towards all the stars, all the protostars in a single cloud, this uh, work by Jonathan Foster using the GBT with a single pixel. Um, and in this case, we observe all the all the protostars 
and all the cores in Perseus. And we try to see what was the effect of the protocellar feedback. In low mass star formation, that means that uh, you can see that uh, the, almost all the points are below the, the line that is a uh, non-thermal component equals to the thermal component. That means that that's the Mach number equals one that separates supersonic turbulence and subsonic turbulence. And you can see that the red and the blue points that mark protostellar or starless objects, they are very well mixed um, in general. So in this case, we can see that the gas is usually at 10K, sub subsonic turbulence, dense is about 10 to the four particles per cc. The gas is ready to form a star. And once it forms a star, the, the feedback is, is, not as, is not as strong or important at the scales probed by the beam of the GBT. Um, so what's next? Uh, it's understand how is the transition then uh, between the supersonic cloud and the subsonic core. And for this, we, we started to do some of the early works on, um, on some of the very first large maps of ammonia. So this is uh, the map that we did with the GBT with a single pixel. Um, and we were able to do a map of ammonia for this core B5, a large region. And here we show the velocity dispersion map. So I'll just highlight that at the center, the white colors, they show very low levels of turbulence. And once you get to the gray section, the level of turbulence is much, much larger, almost a factor of two or three larger. Um, and in this case, you can see that the transition between the light white and the, and the gray is very sharp. So this was a, one of the first example, the first example where we, we resolved, we saw for the first time with a single tracer that the cores, they show subsonic turbulence, but they're surrounded by this supersonic cloud and the transition between subsonic and supersonic material, it is very, very sharp, okay? Um, so, and we make a cut along this transition between subsonic and supersonic, and we make, we show uh, the main component of the line. And what you can see is that as you go along the cut, the separation between these two bumps, which are just the Aberfan component separation, they start to be filled up by emission. And that's because of the broader line widths that are observed. So that's, that's, a, very, that's a very clear way to see from the data immediately if you have line widths that are uh, relatively subsonic or supersonic, just by looking and seeing if this, if this double, uh, double peak feature is seen in the, in the central component. So given this, uh, we were compelled to do uh, larger maps and many more maps to see how common is this. Uh, so for this is that uh, we go to the initial result of gas and this is, these are the previous maps that were, uh, were collected before gas started. So this is uh, the map of B5 that I just showed you. Then there's this large map uh, obtained by Young Min Tseo uh, with the GBT also. Uh, then uh, Rachel Friesen, she did some uh, targeted uh, maps towards uh, some regions within Ophiuchus. And there is the, the map in Orion A that was also combined to VLA. So in this case, these were the best maps available at the time where we started the survey. Uh, what we what we requested were more than 200 hours of uh, ammonia time, and basically we're trying to uh, to to map the ammonia one one line as much as possible uh, in all the in the shallow regions of of where the emission should be in the supersonic region. Uh, the ammonia two two line that would help us to get the temperature, uh, we estimated that that was going to be able to to work only towards the cores. Uh, and then we had some other lines that there were extra bonus just in case we could uh, detect, detect them and then we could do some complementary science. And we basically focus on the, the main regions of the gold belt and targeted everything, basically everything that is uh, with an ex extinction of at least seven magnitudes. And that would uh, allow us to, to map these, these, these regions very quickly with this uh, KFPA 
and we were we proposed for a 0.1 Kelvin uh, T main beam in a 0 0.07 kilometer per second channel. That's the typical noise that we were targeting. Uh, so we were, in this case, we released the first four regions in 2017, and we're the the we're working on the release of this of the final data set at the end of this year, early next year. Um, and here basically are the four regions that we selected initially in GC 1333, a very uh, active staff from in region nearby in Perseus, L1688 uh, of Fucus, the core of Fucus basically, a region in Taurus and Orion A North. So just to go quickly over some of the regions, on the left hand side, you will see the, ammon uh, the column density maps obtained from Herschel. Uh, and on the right hand side, you'll see the integrated density map obtained with ammonia. Okay, so you will clearly see that the uh, that the integrated density maps from ammonia they look very much uh, alike the the column density maps, except for some some uh, particular regions where clearly the um, there is probably material along along the line of sight, but not in material not enough density to really excite the line. So in this case, we're really able to, to select the regions that have uh, dense enough gas of order 10 to the four particle per cc. Um, and this, this shows us that the uh, ammonia is a very good, it allows us to get large regions with, um, uh, with plenty of detections. You can start to see even some fuzzy, uh, like uh, emission outside the, the lowest contour that we map here. And that suggests that there is even emission further out that we're not able to detect because of the noise level. Uh, this is what we were saying that we wanted to do, get kinematics. Uh, so in this case, we get the velocities. Velocity, uh, center velocity is gonna be on the left panel and the uh, velocity dispersion is gonna be on the right panel and these are results from data release one. And you can see uh, on the right hand side, whenever you see dark blue or dark purple, that's going to be uh, almost subsonic levels of turbulence. And if you see like pink colors or yellow colors, that's going to be uh, supersonic levels of turbulence. So in this case, what we can see just by eye immediately is that uh, in the active region, even when there are a lot of stars present, we still see many, many regions with subsonic levels of turbulence. Even in this very active region where there might there could be many components along the line of sight, uh, affected by much more affected by outflows, affected by uh, some of the uh, young by the young cluster that's embedded, we still see that the cores, the dense cores, are very subsonic. Okay, if we go to uh, Slightly, slightly more uh, dense region like Ophiuchus, uh, the L1688 region, we can see that again, uh, we, we, pick out, we pick up the, the highest density places of the emission and we start to see even some faint emission at the bottom uh, outside of the contour, uh, highlighting that there is even a faint emission outside that we we know it's there, but we cannot, we're not going to be able to uh, study it with the tools that we had for the initial data release. And in terms of velocity, again, we see beautiful velocity maps where the most important part, again, is that course, they have clearly subsonic levels of turbulence and have a jump, an immediate jump to supersonic levels of turbulence uh, from the cloud, showing that this transition to coherence. It's, it's, uh, it's commonplace. And now in Taurus, uh, things were a bit tougher in the sense that uh, it's a lower density region. The environment is lower density. So the detection of ammonia, uh, it's, 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 more, it's more sparse, uh, but still we're able to, to see that in, in all these cores, we're able to detect uh, subsonic levels of turbulence and whenever we pick out a little bit more material outside, the turbulence increases substantially, okay? And finally, the monster that uh, uh, we, we put in the first data release to make sure that um, we, we were gonna test our tools on this, uh, 
uh, region, Orion A, because if it worked in Orion A North, it was going to work mostly everywhere else. Uh, so in this case was a stress test target. And in this case, you can see that we detected ammonia in this region all over the place. And the velocity maps, they're beautiful. You can see a clear, clear gradient. But then again, even in this region that is further away and that is much more complex, complex and active, there are a lot, a lot of regions with subsonic cores. So how can we put these together? Uh, we try to put the distribution of all the regions and we try to order them by level of the star formation activity. So for example, we have uh, from top to bottom uh, is the top more qui most quiescent region, bottom is the most active star forming region. And you, can, and you can see on the left hand side is that is the histogram of the temperature and on the right hand side is the histogram of the velocity dispersions. On the left hand side, you can see that in the very quiescent region, the temperatures are very low, very low around 10K. Once you start to see uh, the, the cloud and the, and the feedback from the nearby objects, from the embedded protostars, you start to have an increase in the temperature going up to 15, even 20K uh, in, in some regions, like in, in GC 1333. In Ophiuchus, we see that now the distribution is broader and the peak shifts in terms of temperature. While in Orion, the tail, there is a huge, a st very strong tail that goes up to 30 something Kelvins. In terms of uh, velocity dispersion, you can, uh, you can clearly see that uh, in, in all the regions where the beam is, is small enough to really resolve the structures, we can identify subsonic cores. So these are all the cores that in the past were the only detections of ammonia. Uh, nowadays, we are tracing the surrounding material. Now we can trace the cloud, we can trace the environment. And that is the tail of, of the distribution that we can see next to it. So you can see that clearly everything is surrounded by some supersonic material. We're trying to also take a look at abundances. Uh, the average abundance of a cloud um, can tell you something about the, the, the chemical models and what, what they're doing. Uh, so in this case, we try to compare with uh, simulations of uh, Stella Hofner that she had run and try to mimic the observations and the chemical processes. So in this case, we had a, cl a synthetic cloud that had a, an average density of 900 or 70, 1700 particles per cc. And, uh, and then we try to see if that looked any, anything but different with that, uh, with that small level of um, variation in, in average density. There is not a lot of uh, variation in terms of, of um, the, the detection, the fraction of detection of, the, of pixels across the different clouds, which is what we show in the left panel. So um, on, uh, well on the right hand side, we see that overall, the typical abundance of ammonia seems to seems to be stable at around at around uh, ten to the minus eight. So in this case, that abundance is calculated just as the ratio between H two column between the ammonia column density and the H two column density in places where we have the temperature determined. Okay. Um, so. Another way to do such an analysis is to try to look where, where uh, in time is ammonia going to be formed and is it possible to constrain from the chemical models or constrain the chemical models and see what's going on. So in this case, it's a plot of the abundance of ammonia as a function of uh, the time on which the gas is being around and the different curves are shown for different for different average densities of the box. So in this case, you can see that uh, if we if we were able to estimate uh, to to have a much better constraint on the abundance of objects, then maybe that would be more useful in terms of comparing to to chemical models. But in this case, for the um, uh, in, in terms of what's the, what's the chemical process for, for example, the, the material outside the cores where we detect 
ammonia and where we have a typical abundance of similar to 10 to the minus eight, um, the, abundance, the density is typically 10 to the three. That means that we need to look at, at models at the black model. And at least in that simple, in that simple minded exercise, it, it, it suggests that that dense, that, that ammonia gas should be around at least 10,000 years before we observe it. And so that starts to be uh, something interesting that uh, if we start to get better uh, and nicer, uh, and nicer comparisons between the cloud, the environment, the cores, um, then we're, we're gonna be able to constrain much better the chemical models or, or what's the origin of this surrounding material? Where is the ammonia being formed? Um, so now if we start to, to, to really focus on some of the questions we had, first were, uh, are dense cores gravitationally bound? Well, uh, that's one of the basic things that at least we were uh, taught in, in grad school where cores are bound and that's why at some point gravity will win and it will form a star. So we just went ahead and, and tried to combine the best measurements for, for uh, mass that were in that case were obtained with the uh, SCUBA 2 catalog on Orion and combined with the kinematics of ammonia. So with ammonia, we could get an estimate of what's the amount of turbulence in these regions. And we could do a, a direct virial analysis and see how, how are the cores? Are they bound or are they pressure confined? What's going on? Um, and this was work uh, led by uh, Rachel, uh, by Helen Kirk and Rachel Fritzen. So in this case, what Helen did is she just put everything together, just did calculation of what's the visual parameter. That's alpha. Alpha is the visual parameter. Is if it's below two, it's bound by gravity. If it is above two, it's basically uh, not bound by gravity. And it's something else has to keep it bound or it's unbound. And you can see that for all the cores in this region, they're mostly unbound. And in particular, the orange, the orange symbols, those are from protocellar cores. That means that they did form something. They were bound at some point. Um, so this was a bit per per perplexing. So um, how can we have that such a large fraction of the cores that we observe are unbound? Um, well, one of the things that uh, Helen did was to compare what was the role of the pressure of the cloud. What happens if you have a, the cloud like, uh, like a layer on top to keep it from expanding? So in this case, that would be the pressure due to the gravitational weight of the cloud that is surrounding the core. And in that case, it shows that uh, mo now when we do this, this comparison, if something is below this horizontal line, it is bound by pressure. Uh, and that's, that means that most of the cores are bound by pressure. That's sufficient. We don't need to look for uh, that. It's the pressure of the cloud and the, uh, is sufficient with the gravity to keep things contained. So in this case, that makes, that makes an interesting case and makes us wonder how often do we see something like this? How often is the cloud playing such an important role in, in keeping the cores contained? So we'll, in this case, uh, Helen got, got a, a really great student um, who, where they were looking at the other, the other regions in the, in, in the DR1 the release. And they plotted basically uh, the visual parameter for all the objects that were in the, in the catalogs of the SCUBA catalogs. And here you can see again that if you, if you only take into account turbulence and gravity, the cores they are. Uh, they don't have enough mass to keep it to keep them bound. They need something else. They are almost everything is above two. Uh, if we do if we do the same analysis of comparing gravity and pressure to see what is doing the the main job of of keeping things bound. Now gravity. I mean, so now pressure keeps um, keeps most of the objects bound. So in this case, pressure dom dominates in the bottom section of this horizontal line. And if you look at the, at the vertical line, if you're on the right-hand side, 
you are bound. So half the objects are bound and the other half are not. So in this case, it suggests that we're finding objects that are either transient or they are they or they need to change their mass in order to really be an important part of the star formation process. Um, so in this case, the uh, Hope Chen student uh, was looking at the at the uh, of Fucus data and he started to do a detailed uh, work and the picking up picking out all the little objects that looked like with subsonic line width. So he did a plot of the velocity dispersion as a function of brightness and selected everything that was subsonic and it was coherent on space. Uh, and those objects, he, he called them droplets, basically. Those were the original, um, the, the original project was to find what are the smallest cores that we could find in this region. And he found that you, you can separate cores and droplets in, in basically in as two families, saying that dense cores are going to be shown here in green, and droplets are going to be shown in blue. And the the cores are objects that follow basically um, the, the uh, a mass mass uh, mass size relation that is more or less steep, and the droplets are going to drop off from that relation. And they both have very uniform levels of, uh, of non-thermal components of the amount of turbulence. So in that case, it is not the droplets, they have the same amount of turbulence than the cores, but they don't have enough mass. And in that case, when you look at those, at those objects and those profiles, and you try to see if they are, if they are um, how do they compare to pressure bound objects like Born or Ebert spheres, so the bonnet ever sphere is going to be the, the black curve. And all the candidates of all the objects that Hope found are shown in these little curves. And you can see that most of them depart very quickly from the bonnet ever sphere. And they're very flat, meaning that the cores, they are not uh, in pressure equilibrium. They're not just uh, pressure confined. In addition, they, are, they have a very different uh, density and pressure profile. So in this case, these objects uh, seems to be uh, seems to be coagulating, getting growing into getting uh, to form a core, and that's more clearly shown when we do a plot of uh, of the uh, of the uh, gravity versus pressure, and we see that the blue objects they they are below the red line that shows that um, they're dominated by pressure uh, by ex uh, by the external pressure. So in this case, these are objects. These are small little things. It's, don't have uh, they don't have a lot of mass, but they're being compressed, confined, and looks like they are they need to gain mass in order for them to survive. Okay, so this has been also extended with a new DR2 data that's going to be released soon. Um, and this is work by uh, Ayushi Singh, and she extended to many of these other regions that we did with uh, uh, in Perseus or in Ophiuchus, it was an extension. Uh, and even in W40 and Serpent South. And in this case, she took all of these objects and she started to look at, um, and that's the velocity. And what you, what you can see is that she started to look at the slightly larger structures. She started to look not at the cores, but at the slightly larger structures that she could really um, remove, uh, study the, what's the best way to calculate the real parameter. So in this case, she went ahead and she found that um, in order to really have an accurate measurement of the real parameter to really see if the objects are bound or not, what, they, what you need to do is you need to take into account what's the background column density. So that's the uh, so that's panel E in this plot. Basically, panel D is the data, the whole column density that is obtained. Panel E is the background emission. Then there is some, uh, there is some envelope surrounding the core and then uh, the clamp, and then you have the clamp itself. So then you can start to calculate uh, surface terms, and you, you can calculate what are the what, what is the best way to calculate if something is bound or not. And she ended up showing that uh, with her approach, um, you can make that some of the objects that previously in some other works from, from more distant regions, if you um, you could see that most of, many of the objects would be extremely subburial, which is completely different to what we see in our results from gas, and 
our interpretation is that if you don't remove all the components or if you don't make a careful job on removing the background or taking the different components into account, you will underestimate the real parameters substantially. So that's the difference between the BM92 symbols and the SMJ19 symbols. So the, the, the blue squares are the default, the simple ratio that we calculate most of the time. And the red is what you would get if you could, um, if you could take the, some of the terms into account, okay? Um, moreover, later we're taking a look at, um, at flow of material. So in this case, this is NGC 1333. Um, this is from the DR1 and Mike Chen, he did a, a he started to identify filaments within the data uh, and, and he started to determine, to study if the gradients, if the velocity gradients that are seen in ammonia, if they're uh, random or if they're aligned or if they're perpendicular uh, to the filament. And he found that actually uh, a substantial amount of the, of the gradient, it's along the filament. Uh, well, not a substantial amount, it's perpendicular, showing that there, there could be some flows um, of, of material along the filament, but also into the filament. Um, similarly, in, in TMC1, uh, this is a very, very familiar object for people at the GBT. Uh, and in this case, it, it allows us to do a, a very detailed study on a bright line. Uh, this part of the R2. And um, in this case, we are able to, to study in ammonia this, uh, this end part, the bottom part, the bottom left section of this filament, basically. And he's able to identify three, at least three components in ammonia that are clearly separated. He's identified with uh, a more sophisticated line fitting algorithm, but basically what allows you to, what allows you to see uh, are what are the co co components that are coherent spatially and that share velocity information. So you can see uh, three components that are present most of the time. And if we take a look at the velocity, um, it looks like there, there are gradients. There are transverse uh, gradients, while longitudinal gradients are not so much. And in this case, uh, what it could be, uh, the interpretation is that there, is, there could be material coming into the filament, more or less like from a sheet like the geometry where it comes into the filament and then that gives you um, a gradient transverse to the filament. So this should suggest that actually this material flowing into the filament uh, from, the, from the surrounding cloud. Um, but then one of the questions we have is wh what could have we done with deeper observations? So this is the work that uh, students of us here uh, at the Max Planck, uh, Spann and Chotary uh, push. And he was looking at Ophiuchus and he actually went and smoothed the data. He just uh, worsened the resolution by a factor of two. So he went from 30 seconds to one at minute, but the improvement in noise was substantial. So now he's able to make plots like this, where this is, where this is the uh, Mach number of uh, this is the temperature of the region, the temperature map of the whole cloud. And you can see again, uh, the cores now start to appear as cold objects most of the time. And we're able to estimate the Mach number towards this region. So now we can, you can clearly see that the cores, they have a very low Mach number and the cloud is supersonic, highly supersonic. And then we start to identify regions like core and one shell around that is one beam envelope and two beams envelope would be shell two. And we try to compare what are the differences between the different layers surrounding the cores. And in this case, we can see that actually the, the kinetic temperature and the velocity dispersion as you move away from the core into the outer shell one and the, and the outermost shell two structures, the kinetic temperature increases and the line width gets broader. So that suggests that we're starting to see more and more of the cloud as you go into the, uh, you can see this transition both in temperature and in velocity dispersion. Uh, but more importantly is that if we identify these, these regions 
uh, share some properties, we can stack them and we can bring the noise level down even further. And now we can, uh, we can see that uh, towards our Ophicus A, for example, now we see two components. We see clearly two components that we need to fit. So this shows in green the combined fit and the red and the blue components are the, uh, the red is the narrow component and the blue is a broad component that we need to include. Now you see that in the core, towards the core, we have the narrow component that we always knew existed, but now there is a broad component that we need to include to take into account for the, for the strong wings that we see in the spectra. Uh, similarly, when we go to the shell two, the outermost layer, actually we start to see that uh, the dominating component is the turbulence uh, blue component, supersonic turbulence, but still there is a subsonic component, a red component present. That suggests that even uh, two beams away, like two or three minutes away from the core, there is some subsonic, some subsonic component, some subsonic gas that is present and we have not been able to resolve it. Uh, so in that case, it, it suggests that maybe there's, uh, uh, there is even more sub, uh, substructures, filamentary substructures or compact substructures that are accreting sub sub subsonic material into the core and that were not resolving. So this shows some of the, uh, some of the feature work that could be done uh, yeah. And just to finish up, just to leave some minutes for questions, uh, just a, a summary is that we have made all the data that we publish uh, public immediately, including all the line fit parameters. And that's been quite useful in terms of legacy value for the community. What not is that it has, uh, it, it has helped the community substantially and the, uh, the data has been used in more projects um, than what we originally anticipated. What we can see is that now uh, a common result is that the cores, they do present more or less a sharp transition between supersonic turbulence from the cloud and the core that are subsonic. And that's a common feature across the region. Uh, there is strong evidence that we need external pressure to keep dense cores bound. Uh, also, we, we identify possible seeds for core formation. So regions that are, they show um, very low levels of turbulence, subsonic levels of turbulence, but are unbound because they have very low mass. Uh, in also, we start to see that the classical picture of an isolated dense core that it can evolve by itself and it, the chemistry can evolve by itself, the kinematics can evolve by itself. It, it's, it's challenged by all the different evidences of, of flows of materials that we see in ammonia. And I think that in the future, deeper maps might provide really nice uh, the temperature maps and allow for the full study of the, uh, of the subsonic material that was previously hidden and that is uh, probably feeding this course. Thank you. for a fantastic talk. Um, we'll take questions both uh, in here and if any of our uh, virtual folks just raise your hand or type it in the chat and, uh, and Ellie will, will grab that for you. So yes, uh, Larry. Yeah, so I'm interested in, in how you know, the, the scale of your maps and everything, the depth of your maps um, indicates to me that we should be seeing all kinds of interactions. But it interests me that we don't seem to see interaction of ammonia with outflow or infall, what's going on there? Yes, in this case, uh, what we what we are able to see later when we have uh, have access to uh, combined data between GBT and ammonia is that the region where these outflows have uh, some 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 feedback, some level of uh, of uh, of impact, is mostly um, a few thou a few thousand of you away from the core, or away from the protest It's a very localized. And it's, it's probably the outflow is having, an, it's clearly having an impact on the gas, but uh, you can, the layer that is being traced by ammonia, it's, it's totally dominated by the line of sight that is away, outside of the, of the outflow. 
So I think that's the main reason why we're not seeing the the main effect of the feedback from protesters or things like that. Okay, so it could be contributing to your supersonic lines, but it's smoothed out by the time it's on the scale of the GBT beam. I, I well, in in that case, the um, um, the the line width that we see in ammonia in the broad component in the turbulent component of ammonia um, they are they are well fit uh, with a single component that is broad usually that's the main thing. so if we go back to um, let me just go back to so for example to if you go to this plot so if you look at this component it, it's clearly dominated by uh, a single component. If you're, if what you're saying is maybe this is uh, as the sum of many, many narrow components, right? Then you would expect something like that to start to um, be break up into smaller pieces when you have higher angular resolution observations. Um, and when, whenever we have had uh, access to VLA combined data. Uh, we don't resolve this broad component into many little things. We keep getting the same broad component that is more or less uniform all over the region. It's interesting. That, 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 does it more or less answer the, the question? It does. I'm still curious as to why we, yeah, there's more to it than that, right? Because I, I I think that the interaction of the ammonia with the submillimeter dust isn't as clear cut as we sometimes make it out to be. But and it, and it interests me that we don't necessarily trace the same things, right? When we're looking at what we expect to be the same model of density regions. But yeah, no, that's yeah, it. absolutely. But you've asked my question. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, one quick one. Um, so this is this is really interesting. Are these pre-stellar cores? Because if a star forms, you would expect some feedback to increase turbulence or the temperature. But these look like little islands of calm, cold islands of calm. <laughs> so that, that's great because it's very suspicious, and I totally agree with you. Uh, so in this case, in in in, in a few cases, in one of the few regions where that effect is seen, is this, it's in a, a Fucus B3. So basically, the, it's in a Fucus B. So in this case, you if you follow the dashed line that is full with stars, but it's not dark. I don't know if, you, can you see my mouse? Yes, yes. Yes, okay. So all this region, this is the, this is the Ophiuchus B core, basically. And it appears as highly supersonic. And it has plenty of, of, of embedded sources. So in this case, it looks like the uh, feedback, the effect of feedback is yes. playing the role that we were expecting, right? But in all the other places, in all the other places that we look for example, here in Ophiuchus A, these, uh, you clearly see the subsonic blobs, and then yes. the region of uh, feedback is very localized. Um, so similar effect is also seen in, in we also see it even in, in Orion, if you, if you look at this. So if you look at this, you can see that there are clearly uh, dark spots, very dark spots in Orion. And in most places, it's, it's because, the, I mean, there are still protesters around there. Orion is very hard to find a place where it, it's devoid of, uh, of embedded objects, right? Um, so the, clearly the, the feedback, it's working in some places, but it's not having an effect on the 30 arc second beam from the GBT. That's fascinating. A chance. Do we have any online uh, questions, Ellie? I don't see any. I don't see any hands up either. Good. In that case, I think let's uh, let's thank Hammy again for.